Welcome, family. Welcome back to another episode of Common Conversations. Let's talk about sex. This is a show um, that we're talking about all the things as it relates to health, um, as it relates to sexuality, sensualness, sex, actual intercourse. Um, and we have had some really great conversations as well as some really great experts um, to come in and chime with us. Um, and the whole crew's not here today. It's just Ashley and I. So we get to do this a little I'm different. Scared. You're scared? Yeah, because you don't act You want right. to get a little closer? I don't. <laughs> okay, see, right? We we talk about consent often, right? So can, I, I did not consent. To she does not video. consent <laughs> next. No, you close because you're next. <laughs> We also have to sometimes define our safe spaces. Right? Mm -hmm. So we got a safe space. We There's this about. line. There's a line right and we're going to stay within it mm -hmm. just today. Just for now. Okay, there it is. Let's get it. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> so welcome welcome to the show, right? So we've got a great guest with us today. And this particular episode is going to be centered around HIV, right? Mm -hmm. And how it affects both the white and black community. Um, I hope that we'll get a chance to really take a dive into some disparities. And we're also going to probably tiptoe just a tad bit into substance abuse um, because we know they cross-relate. Um, and the goal here is just to kind of explore, right? Because I don't know everything. Um, I know a little bit, but we got an expert that knows all of it. So I want to welcome Sharita Walden to the, to the show. She got like a whole bunch of letters behind her name. <laughs> I'm going to let does. her explain it. She's got like she an M-A, an L-C-A-D-C. Do you know what it stands for? <laughs> Hell no. Okay, I, so I read your bio. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> what that stands for is a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Yes. Mm -hmm. What what does a licensed clinical drug alcohol counselor do? See, I'm a, that's, man, I love it. So pretty much um, for the last 16 years of my life, I have been working in the field of substance use and prevention, um, providing clinical care, therapeutic care, helping people understand their relationship to substances. Um, there is a relationship that we have. We all have one. We got a substance in front of us right now. Some of us have tea, I have coffee, um, and it's how we move through life. Uh, the work that I do right now simply allows us to accept and own that we all have some type of relationship to substance, whether it's a drug, whether it's illicit, whether it's prescribed, uh, but we do. We have a need, we have a reason why we take it. So uh, pretty, I, I keep it real simple. Uh, so that's really what I do. Can so, I ask, sorry? You can ask whatever you like. Oh, so that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing I'm today. Closer to this line See, okay. um, how did you get involved in that work? What called you to that? Uh, that's very interesting. Um, my story really starts, I, I'm a theater baby. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the theater. Um, I'm from the city of Chicago. Yes, South Side, Shout Town. <laughs> um, but I grew up in theater. Um, my family, like most families, especially in the black community, uh, we have family members who indulged in drugs and alcohol. My biological father, um, went off to Vietnam at 17 and came back an addict. Um, so I didn't get to know my biological father until 12 years ago when he died in Palo Alto, California. But I started off in life really just wanting to act. And I've done professional theater. I went off to college for theater. Uh, but in my senior year at Clark Atlanta University, I was blessed with my now 22-year-old, uh, and walked across the stage with her. And 9-11 happened when I was in Chicago and I was sitting in a theater class and we were, as we were being rushed from downtown Chicago, I was like, I gotta help people. So I became an EMT, mm -hmm. um, an emergency <laughs> medical technician. So I was like, I wanna help people. It's a quick mm -hmm. shift from theater yeah. to that. Yeah, I know, right? And I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't really like blood and I don't like being on ambulances, um, but I still was in theater. I was still doing professional theater in the evenings. Um, but. One of my friends was like, you know what? You could become a, a technician at a non-medical detox. And I was like, that sounds cool. So I went to work at one of Chicago's really good non-medical detox and I saw these therapists and these clinicians and I saw people getting help and I was like, I wanna do that. I wanna be that. And I went off to get my master's um, in counseling. Mm. Uh, fast forward, I started working in the Cook County Jail with women, and what I did was I took my theater 
and took it into my practice. Mm. Wow. So okay. in my groups, any client that knows me, anyone that see me, what they do know is that we were gonna do some acting. Uh, we were gonna do role plays. We were gonna write about it. We were gonna talk about it, but we were gonna act it out. Uh, when I did work um, at an organization here with uh, a HIV positive population, I did that for about four years. Uh, one of our favorite groups those clients would say was our disclosure group, where we would practice how to disclose and use theater. So I brought the theater into practice. I want you to sh show us how to do that, but I got a question for people who are watching <laughs> or listening. What is a non-medical detox? Oh, non-medical detox means that you are toughing it out. So I actually help people. What I would do is hold people's hair back while they would throw up. Uh, why they would go through their withdrawals from different substances. Wow. Um, okay. My job as an EMT would be to uh, monitor people medically. And if we saw that their, um, like their blood pressure was getting too high, their heart rate was going out of whack, we've saved a couple of people from having heart attacks um, because your body can only take so much. Um, I remember one of my favorite clients, she was, I had, really immature people I worked with, you know, sometimes we could be a little silly, uh, but this woman came in, she would walk the city of Chicago with bare feet. And she came into our treatment, our non-medical detox, and I put her in a wheelchair and I saw her feet. And I was like, no one's, no one's gonna do anything. And they were like, no, we're not. I mean, she's here for detox. And I said, but she needs help. So I rolled her into our shower and I washed her feet. And what it did for me was, you know, my mom years before that, several years before that, did a three day breast cancer walk. And I'll never forget on that third, after she did those three days, it was a real walk. She came home and she had blisters on her feet and we were washing her feet. Okay. And so when I sat there with that woman and, and I helped her and she just cried. She didn't expect anyone to do that. She was just there to detox. But what I took into there was that detox was just not about this, the, the physical part and mm -hmm. getting the substance out and coming out of your system. It was also a healing moment. So that's where that drive to become a therapist and become a clinician really, really pushed me because I wanted to really help people. And I got to understand what my dad went through. Um, he died with 10 years sober in uh, California, helping veterans, homeless veterans. So it was pretty cool to see that my life still lined up. But I ain't gonna play. I might be Morgan Freeman one day and get out <laughs> here and y'all see me doing something really dope. I am a spoken word artist, so mm -hmm. I, I still hit the stage because that's my love. But gotcha. like I said, one day you might see me out here like doing some dope. You know, so we gonna see you. Are you doing it? You sitting here today? Yeah. So let's go. Oh, that's so true. Just, that's and, true. <laughs> and, and you took you. So you take theater and you put it into your group, right? Absolutely. So you're dealing with your HIV population patients. What is what does that look like? Can you like real quick give us a you know? If I had HIV, how do, how do we do that? So that's the thing. When we would sit down and talk, you know, people think that those conversations are just different, like what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. To sit with someone who's first of all. HIV is not the only thing that's going on with the person, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't come into a room to you and say, okay, so tell me, do you have diabetes? Do you have high blood pressure? Let's talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. No, we're talking about relationships. We're talking about all these things. So someone comes into my session with me and they're like, you know, I want to date. So I was thinking, you know, my first day, I'm going to be like, look, I'm HIV positive in this. I'm like, oh, slow down, buddy. And they're like, gotcha, gotcha. you know, they're like, well, what's wrong with that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I just feel like if we're sitting talking, I mean, is that the most important thing that's going on in your life? And they're like, no. I'm like, so what do you like to do like on a Friday night? And they're like, oh, that's what I talk about? I'm like, yeah. Like if you tell me, you walk in and you're like, I may just be positive. I need to tell you this right now in this moment. The first thing I'm gonna do is take my ignorance and apply it to the situation. So sure. I'm gonna say, are you about to die? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I need to be afraid? I said, but if you're trying to get to know someone, you start out with the things, back up. Everyone says you can't, you know, judge a book by its cover. I say, that is such a lie. How many people walk into a bookstore and look at the most boring book, basic book, three letters, no color, and go, that's the book for me? 
right? You look at the book, you say, wow, the colors are dope. That's an interesting title. Mm -hmm. Let me flip the page. I said, we are attracted to the outside. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. We do. It's sure. natural. Mm -hmm. You make it curious. You make it interesting. And then we get to the beginning of those intros. That's what gets me. Like, oh, that's a dope intro. You got me in. You're telling me, wait till you get to this part. Now I'm going to turn the page even more. Now you got me. You know, get me through that first chapter. I'm probably going to take it a little bit further. And so that's what we would do. We would sit down and start with the chapters. We would start with the intro. Tell me about yourself. So, so is it safe to say that folks who are, are diagnosed with HIV, that kind of becomes their identity in the beginning? In the beginning, because I think stigma does that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, we have done such a poor job as a nation um, with healthcare and taking illnesses that we don't understand and amplifying it in a way. And we use a fear factor base um, that we lose who the person is. Right, and now it's just you know, now about it's, this disease. Exactly, this and, and what I do is I normalize the conversation around any illness. I don't walk into a room and, and just disclose these deep, deeply vulnerable pieces of me until I built the rapport and relationship with someone, mm -hmm. right? And then I take it to a step because now we have some buy-in and we have this, this, this rapport. We have a relationship. We have something that is connecting us. For me now to say, hey, I want to share something else with you. Um, we scare people with things that we don't understand ourselves. Yeah, this is, I think this is really helpful for me too as a provider because I do um, have conversations with women about at what point do I disclose, whether it's HIV, whether it's herpes or something that they have, like you said, taken on as a part of their identity. They're, they're afraid to tell yeah. someone that they feel like I'll never fall in love with someone. Yes. I'll never, no one will ever love me because of this disease. So how do you counsel people? Like, I know you're saying like, you know, give it some time. You've got to just casually, you're dating someone and trying to get to know them. At what point would you say it's time to disclose? Like, cause people ask me that all the time. I think that it's a, it's twofold to this. So we, we deal with, let's talk about sex, right? We deal with people who are living a sexual revolution in their life. And we always talk about where are you sexually? If you are walking into any interaction with someone and the goal is going to be sex, then you have to determine up front with yourself what is going to happen next. If you know that you're moving towards that, then yes, it is your duty to share what is going on. How we do that is we decide whether we want to make this about education. There's a lot of lack of information for us in our communities, and that's kind of widespread. So not just with the black community, that's just with any community, not understanding where we are in HIV, right? Be at the point where if you have, if you're undetectable, then be, being able to contract or to being able to transmit HIV sexually is at zero, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. So hold on, let's step in before you, because I want you to explain it, because we had Dr. Krager on the show. Oh, and for her. those who are, who are watching or listening and you don't know, right, you're due to the topic. She, you know, one of the things that she says that um, is consistent, that rings in my ears, that um, HIV is not a death sentence. Right. right? And so it's when I was not. younger, I, you know, we saw it and it was like, oh, HIV is AIDS. They're the same. Yes. Thing. Can we can we explain that a little bit? Right. So HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is a virus, right? When we're looking at um, acquired immuno, the disease, when we're talking about AIDS, those are two different. Everyone that has HIV does not necessarily develop AIDS. It doesn't go. We're talking about T cells. We're T cells are those. Now I'm not getting into the medical no, no, part because no, no, Dr. No. Krager, just, yeah, yeah. That's, that's her, her jam, <laughs> exactly. But just to make sure people understand that, just because someone is HIV positive does not mean that they will then develop AIDS. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's the misconception. Yeah, is that I think people in the hear that. community, people use them interchangeably yes. as if they are the same. And it's not. And they're not. There are people yeah. who are living with HIV long term who have never developed AIDS who are at an undetectable status, meaning that they, their viral load is so low in the body that is not detected, okay? Gotcha. That's what undetectable mean. But we have a lot more individuals that are living their very healthy life, 
actually more healthy than some of us. Um, some of us dealing with diabetes, cholesterol issues, um, you know, issues with with our mental health. Like there's a lot of people living HIV positive, but also much more healthy because they're being more intentional about mm -hmm. their body. They're taking the antiretroviral medication, which is what keeps the HIV, the virus itself, at that undetectable level. Got you. Thank so, you. So just I, to give that a little bit. But Dr. Yeah. Craig, she's dope. Yeah, she is. She's fire. She, <laughs> yes. She's on, we're going to have her back and, and take some That's other awesome. deep dives. Yes. Um, so I had a couple stats, and I'm curious, because you said community and, mm -hmm. and kind of bringing it in. And one of the stats that I have was like one in um, 27 African-American men will be expected to be diagnosed with HIV, where their white counterpart is one in 171 persons. Um, and then it's like one in two, 50% uh, of all men who have sex with men are diagnosed with HIV. And I'm, I'm gonna focus on men in this space because I, I keep having this question in my head. I was like, so, you know, if you are gay, you're more likely to get AIDS, not if you're heterosexual, right? Or, is, or you know, what, HIV. Or HIV, right. So what, is, how do, what does that feel like, look like for those who are actively having sex, um, whether it's hetero or gay? I think that we, and, and this is more of my, I'll say opinion, um, because the stats, they are accurate. I think what we're seeing though is this space where people, these labels of who is doing what behind the closed doors and people not wanting to label themselves, so men sleeping with men. Um, we keep leaving out women who are involved with these men who are becoming positive, um, women who are married to the same men. So I, I look at, when I hear the stats, I always, and I hear you, I know that men seem to be at the top. Um, I'll tell you from my perspective though, there are programs in my role that I'm in now um, that we operate in, in this city, the syringe service programs. and. We don't have a lot of black men, let alone black women, but black men that come to our services. And when I say our services, the syringe services programs in this city um, that are operated in conjunction with the health department, uh, we provide sterile syringes to individuals who use syringes. Syringe use can be at the highest rate of transmission. Why? Because we got blood, yeah. right? We're talking about direct blood. Unfortunately, we are not, the black community is not the highest, uh, is not one of the highest communities of actual syringe use. You're talking about out of the 100% that use it, we're talking about maybe 15% are black community members, right? Huh. Yeah, that's not a lot. We don't have a lot of engagement. What that also tells me is that we cannot determine that HIV transmission is just syringe, primarily syringe use for us. Now in other communities, especially white communities, absolutely. We saw it in Indiana when it happened with the up, the, that real uptick of HIV yeah, transmission. Yeah. Yes, when that happened and the syringe service program came in and you saw it take this deep dive, right? Well, it was a white community. White community members tend to use it more the decrease in fatal overdoses. And I'm not gonna step away from HIV, I'm bringing it back no, around. No, you're good, because I, I actually that, have a question. That decrease in fatal overdose that was experienced here in the state of Kentucky, that 5% decrease was the white community. Mm -hmm. It was not the black community. So what does that say? That says that we don't have black people practicing with PrEP, which is pre-exposure, prophylactics, right? This is what, this is the medication that you can take if you're going to continue to have uh, unprotected sex or have sex with someone and not know their status to protect yourself, right? We don't have that. Um, we don't have clear understanding of transmission still in our community because we're not talking about syringes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, gosh, this is such a great moment for us to see the 8.9% increase of fatal overdoses in the black community in Kentucky. There was an 8.9%. That is not just syringe use. That's because black folks don't use syringe as much. As much. They, they snort, they inhale, they pop pills. So we're not talking about same route. But when it comes to sex, we're talking about riskier sex acts. We're talking about anal sex mm -hmm. has a much higher risk. Why? Because of all these blood vessels, all these nerve endings, all the potential for there to be a crack 
a break in the skin and exposure. So we're talking about routes of sex that we're still not talking about. How do I talk to my young man, my 17 year old about sex? When I started talking about sex, it wasn't when you go put on the condom to have sex with your girl. I said, hey, if you wanna stick your penis in anyone or anything, use protection. We don't talk like that to our kids. The same way I talk to my daughter about, hey, save yourself for the right person, I do it with my son. Hey, save yourself for the right person, everybody don't need access to you. Yeah. So we do not talk about, and it, I get passionate about this. Nah, let it go. Because yeah. we don't talk about sex. We don't talk about masturbation. Me, I, I, I remember talking to my girlfriends like, if I had taught my daughter that masturbation is the key, she probably wouldn't have had sex so early with someone else because it would have been a, an empowering moment to say, figure out what you really like so you could put these up to test them and their quality, right? Mm -hmm. So now what I do is when I'm talking to people, I'm like, hey, have those conversations as general and as open as you can. If we do that, then when someone is exploring their sexuality, because it's all a spectrum anyway, when a kid is saying, hey, I'm interested in having sex with someone of the same gender, specifically male bo boys, gender, they're born male, boys decide they want to try something with another boy, at least they understand that they should be pr protecting themselves. Yes. It's lack of knowledge. I get upset when I see uh, sisters that I've learned of their status because they've been married to someone that they trusted. And I, and I get it because I done men groups, groups with just nothing but men. And understanding that when we do these sex ed talks in these groups and we're talking about how to protect ourselves, we do not acknowledge that sex is this fluid energy. We don't acknowledge it. So we have guys walking around who don't really understand how to approach sex with another man. And that's, that's where we fell in. Mm -hmm. What do you think that is? Is it, is it because of the stigma of being gay? Yeah, yeah for sure. Absolutely. So, yeah, you know that. And then you take those guys and put them in a room and say, check this box. <laughs> you want them to disclose their sexuality yeah. on this piece of paper. So how many of the people that are actually being diagnosed as with positive HIV that are they might, telling it? are they telling the truth? Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, because this came up in a, in, a, in a different show that we did where um, Amira was talking about a friend of hers who likes anal sex, but mm -hmm. isn't gay, Yeah. right? Um, and so we, we make this assumption, and I'm asking, because I'm also equally curious from the two women sitting here, both from expertise and then your thoughts, you know, do, are, are men who like anal sex, what, what part of that, when do they become gay and when is it not? What? So... <laughs> <laughs> Miguel, so that's essentially saying that certain sexual behaviors yes. are attributed to a certain group of people. Like exactly. The LGBTQ plus community doesn't own anal sex. They okay. don't. So that's not fair. Like it would. I mean, stop it. I just had to ask. I, I mean, was curious. I just, I've never. I I've, I've not ever asked. I know, and I think it's interesting to have that part of the conversation because I had a feeling you was about to ask that question. So. <laughs> I think, and I love how you frame that, you know, anal sex is not owned by this one community, right? That is so dope to say it that way. Cause then I'm like, well, I mean, so for oral sex for women, yeah. I, so is that an indicator that one day this woman is gonna say, you know, what, eh, I'm done with men because she really likes oral sex. And I'm like, that's, it's so crazy that we have genderized sexual acts and, and we've made it so taboo that what's happening in the bath bedrooms come out as a, we got to identify it as something and stigmatize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's just unfair that couples can't explore things. And I also think it's ridiculous. Like, I mean, a whole guy can go get a prostate exam and realize that they, get, they have an erection and get frustrated. And it's like, dude, because you have a body. Mm -hmm. And there's these parts of us that some, some things you don't even know and some things you don't even know until you get older. And women, this is the maturity of women is that as we get older, me becoming this older woman, I've been excited since I turned like 38. I was like, gosh, these 40s feeling dope. <laughs> Finding out more and more about what I like 
and what I'm into and what I expect, um, it is absolutely amazing. And it makes so much sense why older women tend to have sex with younger men because there's this, this really cool dynamic that's happening where older women are like, yeah, you could do all these kind of things to me that I probably wouldn't have did when I was 25 because now I'm like, baby, I, I need you to understand what's happening inside of me, yeah. right? Yeah. You You're own old, it. You As you own get it. older, you just own it. And, and it's like, I like this. I exactly. don't like that. do this. Let's play over here. Exactly. But I think until you get to a point where you feel you really have and understand yourself and your body, it's mm. very hard to say, hey, I'm a straight man, but I like anal I like anal play, where, yeah. where it makes so much sense. There is such a very sensitive part there that I wouldn't understand why a man wouldn't. It's on your body. Why are you de denying yourself something? Because someone told you that that route is... It makes you... It makes it's you bad. Gay. Yeah, you're yeah. on this... You're labeled. Yeah. Right, now you're labeled. Gay. But also, it ain't none of nobody's business. It's... <laughs> well, you know, everybody runs around and shares, right? But, and, and, but one of the things I thought was interesting, again, about our conversation and then having this conversation about HIV and understanding that HIV for men is a stigma saying if you if a man has HIV, he's gay, right? I know everybody had that question about Magic Johnson when it first came out, Exactly. Right? They were looking at him like, we know you banging a lot of chicks, but dude... How'd you get that? Right. You know what I mean? What were you doing, right? And maybe, you know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but it's always been that question for me, right? And then as we continue, or as I've had multiple conversations with different folks who have um, different, uh, different kinks or yes. different relationship to their sexuality, you know, there's this constant conversation that keeps coming up and it's like, man, you know, what makes a man gay? Mm -hmm. Right. And then I wonder how women also see it. Right. Because if you've got a man and, and you're you're in a hetero relationship mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, you know, your guy says, hey, will you put on a strap on, you know, hmm, mm. what does that what does that do to the nature of that relationship and right. that couple if you're not prepared for that? So I don't know. Y'all, we, we went that direction. We're way off topic. We did. Y'all open the door. It's relative. And I'm, I'm, thank you for letting me ask. But it's relative because what we were talking about was the risky behaviors that can influence or lead to, um, you know, an HIV positive yes. status, yes. right? And when we're talking about anal sex, so that's where it really came, it really came from is talking about one of the riskier, you know, sexual acts. But we can look at it all. And the problem is there is going to be skewed information because even though this paper is confidential, I'm giving it to a practitioner, a practitioner is keeping it in this chart that's away from everybody, I still have to see it and I have to own it for myself. Mm -hmm. So I have to own it for myself. So I think um, it's just so hard in our community, in every health disparity out there, <laughs> for us to figure it out. But what I take it back to is lack of education, lack of authentic conversation and uh, conversations that it, without judgment. Mm -hmm. And that's what it just comes down to. If I can have these kind of conversations, and I always said it with the groups when I worked at that organization, those conversations with those men that got to some brutal, honest spaces in a small space like Louisville, because Louisville's small. Yeah, it and, is. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people sleeping around with everybody that, that knows each other. And just really unpacking what men deal with and in, in the insecurities and the inability to one day get up and say, you know what, I have not been honest with myself like me and just say, I think I'm fitting into this pansexual identity. Me, Sharita, in my 40s, I can feel comfortable doing that because there's this wild thought that women can be free to sleep with women or do whatever they want. But when it comes to a man, I'm like, we are all human. You think there are men who do not share the similar experiences as women who have grown and blossomed into themselves? That's so unfair to think that it's okay for me, but a male sitting next to me cannot experience this same revolution? How dare we? How, how dare we create a world where, where now we have to worry about fear of someone giving me something I did not ask for, an, an illness that I will have to manage for the rest of my life, simply because 
He just did not own who he was. That's so unfair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what I learned working and sitting with men is like, gosh, if you had these safe, brave spaces to open up and say, I've always wanted to explore. I don't see anything wrong with that. To hear men who I'm sitting here like, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because no one says anything wrong with me. So on this journey, because I mean, it's also part of one of our bigger questions, right? Or conversations is health, right? Yes. Um, safety. Mm. And, and if we can, you know, avoid STDs, then mm. that's, the, that's the best path, the best pathway. Um, how do we begin to, if there's such a, a stigma, it's so taboo, and I'm hearing it specifically more for men, how, how do we as a community or build a community where it becomes a safer space for men to engage in that kind of conversation? We gotta, we gotta get honest and we gotta start holding people accountable. We gotta stop being afraid. I think too many of us, and when I say us, I am really speaking particularly to the black folks who watch this. We are so afraid to push envelopes. You know, I had the privilege of growing up in a very uh, militant Afrocentric household. Both of my parents are retired now, but the Chicago police officers, detectives, um, my stepfather, one of my stepdads, cause you know, got a few. Um, <laughs> one of my too. stepdads, that <laughs> is, is, is a Black Panther Party member, David Lemieux, um, and my mom, Randella Taylor. They, they instilled all of this dopeness in me. But the one thing that I tell people, it's really hard for me not to be direct. And, I, I, and I'm not scared. Um, a lot of black folks are scared. They're scared because they have built relationships with white people that they trust. And I got white friends, but I always tell them, and if they ever watch this and they see me, they know me. I always say my white friends understand that they, this access to me doesn't come without access to privilege. You don't get to say you're a friend to me. And, and then I don't be in the spaces that I need to be like down in the AG's office or at uh, the governor's office. Like I don't, you don't get to say we friends and I don't have access to the privilege. Um, but there are too many black folks who think that they have, they have a perception of privilege that they have and they don't. So when it's time to go to faith leaders and say, you are part of the problem. No one wants to back me. Um, there's a saying I learned, and I won't use the whole word. I learned it when I went to National Harm Reduction Conference last year in October, which was so dope. It was in Puerto Rico. Um, my first time there. It was scared ends. Scared ends don't get choices. Scared ends don't, don't get, get choices. choices. Mm. One thing about me and one thing about, I've never, I had a friend tell me, Sharita, it's like you don't have anything to lose. And I said, no, correction is, I have everything to lose if I keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. We got to hold the faith community accountable. You have created a way where your space is no longer safe. Mm. People are literally dying Marriages are falling apart. And the only thing that you can sit up and focus on is because someone wants to have sex with the gender that, that's the same as a problem. And you have people who are losing limbs because of poor eating habits, poor because of gluttony, which is, I, I believe, a sin. But you want to focus on if I want to have sex with a woman because I'm married to her or I... I'm in a committed relationship where I'm not cheating. Or a man who, who dresses feminine or feels good and secure in his femininity, right? You want to focus on that, but you don't want to focus on why moms are burying their children. You don't want to focus on why people can't come into the church house and, and, and still deal with their substance use. You don't want to focus on any of those things, and you better not come in there talking about HIV because a lot of them still living in the 80s. So when I look at why, I look at the faith community. 
We've allowed systemic racism to, to come inside. And don't get me wrong, systemic racism is a part of why the Bible is treated the way it was. I mean, you know, slave owners actually used the Bible to make us do what we needed to do. Because God said so, right? So I get it. But I look at black faith leaders specifically, and I say, you need to be held accountable. If I'm going to hold our government accountable, you don't think I want to hold whole faith leaders, but what happens is black people walk away from me. I'm often going to be alone. People always say, where did you come from? Mm -hmm. When they started hearing me talk, I said, because, because I don't join movements where I'm just walking up and down the street because I'm mad. My movement is really deep. Mm -hmm. I was locking my hair when, when it wasn't a trend. People were calling me Whoopi because that was the only person they had a reference for, my own people. I didn't become a poet because it was cute. I was writing in my English class in my senior year because I was getting treated poorly by my friends. And then Love Jones came out and I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this, right? But I keep telling people, it's not a trend for me, my blackness. I show up black and the only time in my life I could ever just not code switch was the four years I was in Atlanta, at Clark Atlanta, and I had a professor, Grady, from Fred Sanford and Son. My professor cussed me out. He cussed me out because I showed up late, not because he was white and I was black. It was because I was late and it was unprofessional. And I cried and turned around and said, one day I'm going to talk about Grady cussing me out. And this is amazing. And I was pregnant. And he said, this is unprofessional. Don't you ever do this. And a lot of people, especially one of my friends that's in this room, will probably say, and she's still late to this day. And I know that. And Grady is probably looking at it. But I, I say all that to say that the, the passion and the fight that I have in me, y'all, nobody wants to join that team because they scared. They scared of losing access to the privilege that they have with those that got more and I'm not. I'm scared, like Fred Hampton say, I'm, I, I'm not gonna die by no plane. I'm not gonna die slipping on no ice. I'm gonna die for my people because I love my people. I love my people. I'm going to die for the people. I really do fight for our people, but not a lot of us fight for us. So when I approach a church or I approach someone, I ain't got a crowd behind me because people are like, I ain't going to say nothing. I'm sitting here like y'all got blood on your hands, just like this government do. And I think, too, like, wait, I feel like what you're speaking to is um, having true community, right? Yes. Because I think yes. when you exist in a space where, in, you know, families fight. It doesn't mean I don't still love you. But, exactly. But... Um, at, we, at the end of the day, I think in order for us to truly affect change, we have to have some very candid and yes. very courageous conversations yes. as a black community. So I really feel like that's that's kind of what we're speaking to. So do we have time to go into the other piece or are, are you about to wrap us up? Because I see it on your face. You know, let's 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 jump into it real quick. <laughs> I know, right? No, you good. <laughs> I mean, like I'm in my head, I'm like liberator activist. Right. <laughs> which 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 do you claim also, or do who you was claim? On your both? earrings that you just took off. Uh, I don't know that sister. Um, it was um it looks like uh, Angela Davis. But it it, it did, mm -hmm. and she was giving me those vibes. But when I saw them, I was like, gosh, those are mine. So um, it's not a it's not a known. It's an artist, I'm sure, that found a beautiful sister to draw. We'll have let's to uh, drop pictures of her earrings Absolutely. in the. In but the, let's go into the last yeah. piece before we wrap up. Okay, fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because this, this has been great. Yeah. And we want to make sure that folks get something out of this yes. right? and, mm -hmm. they, and they take away. And I know our, our latter part was talking about um, an overdose that occurred locally, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And understanding that um, there's a dynamic happening. And, and I'll, I'll lead with this because uh, it's, it's related because I have a lot of friends and family who knew these folks. Yeah. Um, and the conversation that we had privately kind of went like this, you know, how is it that black people don't have access mm. to information as it relates to the overdoses that are happening in our community? Or do we not have access to Narcan? Or, or, and then I remember posing a question and we started talking about drug use. So growing up, and you, you you mentioned a little bit, we talked about hot boxing, mm -hmm. right? Or we talked about how some of the homies used to lace um, their weed with coke. And we knew drug dealers that actually lacing their whole kit with mm -hmm. and bombing fluid, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And selling it. Or yeah. they were putting PCP mm -hmm. and selling it to folks so that they could get hooked on other things, right? But, I, you know, you mentioned something before we started, and, and I, 
I said it mentioned, I mentioned a little bit, but I forgot about how often other people lace their weeds so they yes. can chase a high, yeah. right? Because after a minute, a thing is not not the thing it's anymore. Not a thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to touch base, if you would share, you know, kind of what we talked about and touch base on that, um, you know, as it relates to what we're facing today. Yeah. Um, first, I, I definitely want to say my heart and thoughts go out to the family um, that lost the, the young man that lost his dad and, and his partner or girlfriend, I'm not sure what, what they were. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a little bit of both. It's not just that the black community doesn't have access. The black community suffers from um, a, a comfortable ignorance. And I say that with love. <laughs> Um, we are out here providing the information and education and tools, but we don't acknowledge that this is about us. And it's because of the war on the failed war on war on drugs and, you know, the crack epidemic and how we were jailed and all these things. But right now, it's a moment for us to take advantage of this. So it's a, it's a moment and a movement. But for this couple, hearing the stories of laced weed and this idea that it was uh, pretty much just unknown that there was something else in there with the weed is one of the myths that's going around in our community, and it's twofold. The first thing is if we perpetuate a, a rumor of it was just unintentionally laced, it's leading towards what we are coming up on fighting in legislative session coming up. I'm going to going to be a part of it in October, um, and it is the criminalization um, and the idea that we're looking at mandatory minimums for fentanyl. And if anyone hear me say mandatory minimums, you are and you were born and, and alive during the time of the war on drugs, then you go back to the crack epidemic and how people were getting locked up um, for having crack, right? Uh, so that's what we're looking at. So when we hear, oh my God, it was laced. What I do in my work is say, hey, we're looking at cross-contamination. So if these individuals that were having a good time, wanted to have a good time, did not choose to add a pill that they may have thought was a molly or ecstasy or something to excite their night, uh, a perk to make sure that the high would extend a little bit better, if they didn't choose to add that in there, we could be talking about cross-contamination, meaning if someone is putting together their substances, who's packaging it and going to sell, my street pharmacist, um, they're not wiping down their, their, their equipment. Um, the, the baby that died in January of 2022, when I started this role, uh, was a little girl out in the PRP area who may have touched something on the table. Cross-contamination, not cleaning up where you are packaging can be harmful to people. So if someone is packaging weed and they're also packaging Coke and they're packaging heroin, they're packaging and they're not wiping it down, there's a possibility that fentanyl can get onto marijuana. But some of the things that I teach people, especially my weed smokers, because I got a lot of them around me, because we are not a legal state yet, uh, we don't have dispensaries. So being mindful that if you show up to a session, that you don't show up to a session where the blunt is already rolled. You want to know what's happening with that blunt. You want to know what's in there. Bring your own stuff. If you don't want to experience an, an additional high and you don't trust who you with, don't smoke from that one. And then watch other people. In the world of harm reduction, we say go slow before you go. Yeah. So you're testing. Taste it. Hit it. What does marijuana do to your body? Marijuana should not have you nodding. It should never have you do that. If you're experiencing this, you're going down, your breathing's starting to get slower, then yeah, this might be something else additional, okay? Never use alone. Those two individuals use the same thing together, so it's as if they used alone. There's an actual number that people are calling that if you don't uh, want to use alone, but you are by yourself, you call this number so that people can make sure that you don't overdose and die. Hmm. Okay, or they'll walk you through how to test. There's fentanyl test strips. They have been made legal this year. Test your products. You can test marijuana too. I was gonna ask you about that because I was curious. 
So where would you get a fentanyl test strip? So I am the executive director for Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition, and we were the first organization to provide them while they were illegal. Yeah, we abolitionists. Um, <laughs> uh, that we we provide fentanyl test strips, um, and in fact, I got fentanyl test strips with me today in Narcan. Um, that I could leave for anyone that's here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we we provide fentanyl test strips to the community. We show you how to use it. Um, fentanyl test strips for marijuana, there's a couple of ways to do it. I tell people to do a good eyeball, but if you see a, like a dusting on your plant, I tell people to use the bag, because this is what our participants, people who actually use, have told us. Use the bag, put the water in there, and test the bag. And if the bag comes back positive for fentanyl, then yes, it has fentanyl on it, right? Um, you can test the bulb, but it's a little bit difficult. Yeah. So, but we have those products, our organization, people can order them. We also have a, a location in the West End of Louisville, which is where a lot of our high, our highest number of overdoses are happening here in Louisville. It's at the Redeemer Church um, over in West Louisville. That's where we are on Mondays, and we have fentanyl test strips, we have Narcan and other harm reduction products. The reason why this is so closely related to HIV is because we also do testing. We do HIV testing, we do hep C testing, and we also provide resources, and we provide safe sex supplies. I also now have a new collaboration where we provide a birth control. We provide Plan B. We provide things that people need access to. Um, and later on in the year, I'm gonna provide more things for our community up in New York. They have safe smoking kits. They also have safe marijuana kits, something I've never seen before. I love all the stuff you're sharing. And, and I'm curious, right? Cause you're, we're in Louisville mm -hmm. and I know right across the river, less than a mile, we got a whole black community who's asking the same questions. And unfortunately, not, I won't say none. I will say very little of what we're discussing today is happening in any of the population, right? Both white, black, or otherwise. But definitely, as, as recent conversations, the black community is saying, how do we learn this? How do we get access? Where's the information? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how we connect being across state lines in that relationship, but I would love to bring you over there um, because I think this whole, this whole conversation as a whole needs to be, um, need to be shared. And I think sometimes it has to be in person. But if folks are watching, share it. If you're listening, mm -hmm. share it. Um, you know, this is a wealth of knowledge. And the more, the more information we have, the more power we can be. Um, and you, what did you say? Black folks are in a willful ignorance. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's a, uh, I can't remember. But it is that ignorant, willful ignorance is a good one too. Um, but we, we choose this ignorance right now. Yeah. You know. And I, and I love that you use Fred Hampton, one of my favorites. You know, um, he built a real community. And I think we have to get back to that space. Um, you, you poked at the, the um, religious community and sometimes I, I pick at them as well because once upon a time, our black, our black pastors were our leaders. Were. And, and, and that seems to be a bit uh, segregated sometimes, yes. right? And, and so we're picking, we're picking our poison, so to speak, in, in which we're going to educate folks mm -hmm. on and build. And I think we do have to be consciously aware of all the things that affect our community as a whole. We Absolutely. have to own that and control that. So I appreciate you being here. It yeah. has been a pleasure mm -hmm. to sit with you today. I thank you for all the knowledge. And um, you got to come back and play with us and yes. hang out and do some more. Is that this cool? This has been great. Yeah. I really thank enjoyed you. it. Yeah. Doc, any takeaways before we walk out of here? God, you always ask me that. And you always try to put me on a timer. So. I know, right? No timer today. What? I don't even have a watch on. Well, that watch don't have battery anyway. But let's go. None, <laughs> none of my watches have batteries because I don't believe in telling time. <laughs> really? True story. Except for when we're in class and you're trying to tell people to start on time. They pay me to be on time. Oh, okay. I'm just checking. <laughs> it's African culture, too, you guys, that we are not about time. We're about what happens in that the time. The experience yes, is yes. present. We are present here today. Um, I guess my takeaways, there are lots. There's so many pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the main things is, like, we have to, as a community, be engaged in very um, convicting, but candid conversations about what's going on in our community as it relates to sex, as it relates to, um, you know, drug abuse, as it relates to HIV, and just um, be willing to engage in conversations and, and be educated versus living in fear. Let's get it. Let's go. Sherry, you think you want to leave for the audience, uh, folks who are listening, watching? 
I think just you all creating this kind of space and, and then taking it back to your own personal communities. Um, let's get back to our childhood of building relationships with our friends and telling each other secrets. Yeah, they kept, they, they kept us safe. Um, talking to each other, being open, um, it's scary and I get that, but we could actually rise above and the meek will inherit the earth, but we have to speak up and we have to vocalize. Mm -hmm. That's it, my good people. Let's build community. Let's give each other agency and empower us to live our best lives um, and face the things that we cannot change, that we can change them. Real talk. This is Common Conversations. Let's talk about sex. We'll see you in the next episode. This program is supported by the Health Equity Innovation Hub at the University of Louisville. The views expressed are not necessarily those of the funder.